a desperate plea from Ukraine to powerful military and political leaders who are gathered here in Halifax. I'm Mercedes Stevenson here at the Halifax International Security Forum, where some of the world's most important decision makers are getting together, talking about war, peace, democracies, and our future. And one item more than any other has dominated the agenda in discussions, and that is Russia's war in Ukraine. Ukraine says Russian missiles targeting its energy supply are leaving millions of people without power and heat as winter approaches. A feature interview with Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister about what the country needs right now from Western allies, including Canada. And last week's missile strike in Poland was a stark reminder to NATO about just how quickly it could be drawn into Russia's war. I'll ask NATO's top military officer about what's at stake and what's next for Ukraine. Ukrainians are preparing for a potentially brutal winter ahead as Russia continues to weaponize things like food, heat and power. I sat down with Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Olga Stefanishinow to ask her what Ukraine needs from Western allies now to make it through this winter and this war and how to stop Putin. Here's that conversation. Deputy Prime Minister Stefanishinow, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Canada. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for having me here today. Can you describe for us what the situation is like right now for the people of Ukraine? Well, we got used to, to live in darkness. Uh, both, to, both being affected severely by, by multiple crimes committed against people, but also the first thing I noticed when I landed to Montreal is that there's so much light around you. This is not what we have. Uh, but I think that the, what is more important is the spirit. This is the spirit which cannot be undermined by any measures of demoralization. Uh, Russia try, tries to put on Ukraine, whether it's destroying critical infrastructure, attacking residential buildings, massive torturing of population in the occupied areas, or uh, any uh, failure on a battlefield which forces them to use the hybrid warfare as a major method of their, uh, of their aggression. So uh, I think that the major spirit in Ukraine is that there's no way to surrender. There's only way to victory. And uh, this leads to a permanent failure of Russian Federation. Although, of course, the suffering uh, and the losses among population are really, really serious. And you talked about that lack of light. It's, it's powerful because we take here for granted. You're right. The street lights are on. Our power grids are going. Ukraine, like Canada, is a cold country in the winter. And the Russians are attacking your power, your energy. Um, that is such a danger for the civilian population. How do you deal with that? Uh, well, uh, I think that the most important thing that we have not been dealing with that only by ourselves. Uh, after the first massive shelling, uh, counting around 90 rockets like four weeks ago, and this shelling are taking place on a weekly basis with the same massive uh, missiles attacks throughout the area of Ukraine, we have not been standing alone. As President already uh, said publicly, it's around 40% of the elements of the critical infrastructure throughout the uh, Ukraine, mostly the central part of Ukraine, which is not affected by military warfare, uh, has been damaged. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, important that we are restoring back the infrastructure in a very fast and operative way. Basically, all our technicians are also the heroes, uh, a part of the fact that they are not with a gun on the battlefield. Uh, but it would not be possible without uh, a strong mobilization from our partners across European Union and and, and uh, a wider group of allies. But it's also a very important sign that the Russians has also failed to uh, attack uh, Ukrainian elements of the critical infrastructure through hybrid or cyber attacks. This has uh, left no room for them but to try to physically destroy what we have. What does Ukraine need right now from the West and from countries like Canada? What can we do? 
uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, supporting the restoration of the electricity grids of course we have shared the list of our needs and uh, we encourage the the companies uh, the companies operating in the electricity market to mobilize their efforts to provide us with everything which is needed this is a very precise list of technical needs of course we all need generators and the more generators that we have that the uh, the better it could ensure the security and stability of the networks it can ensure the stability of uh, um, of the of the lightning uh, uh, in the in the residential buildings but it also can ensure the stability of functioning of the state itself because connection and electricity and energy is the basis of uh, of, of functioning of, of the of the country itself so uh, making sure that we have enough generators and we have enough uh, uh, technical uh, elements which we need to to make sure that we can address and be resilient towards this attack is important, but it's not as important as the ability to close the sky and to save our people, to save our lives and to save our infrastructure. We need more anti-air defense systems, which will be uh, making, which would enable us to restore the damaged infrastructure, to regain uh, regain the sustainable reconstruction throughout the war and to make sure that we save the lives of our people. Do you feel that NATO countries are willing to give that to you? Are they, are they listening? Uh, well, uh, they are. They are. There's been a significant uh, uh, breakthrough, I would say, in terms of providing Ukraine with anti-air uh, uh, defense, uh, defense means, let's say, from various countries, even from those countries like Spain, which has not been there uh, before the first massive shelling. But uh, uh, this is the time where we should go beyond, beyond what we can and that what we are doing on a daily basis in Ukraine, whether it's about military uh, and armed forces of Ukraine, whether it's about those people providing humanitarian assistance or politicians and ministers who are doing everything possible to go beyond, uh, beyond any measures and beyond any boxes. So if uh, some of the allies still think that they've done uh, everything they could, we assure you that you didn't because the war is lasting, people are dying and, and the families are losing their loved ones. Is that frustrating when you know what you need and you know your allies have the ability to give that to you and you're watching people who you know and care about die around you, but they're worried. They're worried about potentially escalating with Russia. They're worried about NATO being pulled into that. I'm wondering what that's like for you as you, you try to balance competing priorities but stand up for your people. Yeah, personally, there's been a lot of frustration in the beginning of uh, war uh, because to some extent from Kiev, from Ukraine, uh, you see things much more clear that, than many leaders and many politicians across uh, across our partner countries because we're not by, so our ultimate goal is to survive and to save our people. There's no other balances we should, we should, uh, we should, we should, we should ensure. So there's been a lot of personal frustration, but uh, from the very beginning, we knew a couple of very principal issues. We do not take no for an answer if there's something we need to protect our people. And practice shows that it's a matter of time when partners are coming to the same conclusions. And we are, we are now uh, with, a, with a very coordinated military support provided through coordination through the Rammstein format. This is already a historical decision, but still we need more. And we hope that uh, the very good uh, coordination processes which has been established would allow to take decisions faster to plan our military uh, military um, theater let's say uh, in a more smooth and precise way and will allow first and foremost to save the lives of our people who are dying are you worried about the potential for a nuclear strike uh, of course we are, and, and we're extremely worried of the fact that uh, this nuclear threat could be materialized through a massive provocation on the Ukrainian nuclear object like nuclear, like Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, like Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, Russians would never act bluntly by simply shelling uh, the, the nuclear bomb to Kiev. They would do the hybrid methods, and, and for us it's really important that first, uh, international partners and leaders would have the equal reaction to any nuclear blackmail or nuclear threat which will be posed by Russia, even if it's done through using Ukrainian nuclear objects like Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, but from the other hand, we understand that this nuclear threat will be hanging 
over all of us, regardless the fact whether we react strongly or not strongly. There will be such a threat as long as Putin is in power, as long as the war is there, as long as Russia has any hunger for any aggression, whether in Ukraine or Poland or any other country around the world, this threat will be there. The thing is that what we are doing, uh, if we're like acting in a way that we do not want to irritate Russia, this nuclear threat will always be there. And this hunger for being unpunished will always be there. So um, we anyway call upon action to stop Russia, to end the war. And uh, we should do it fast. We should do it co in a coordinated way. And I think that it is us, Ukraine, and partners who should make the decision when the war is over, not the Russians. And how do you make that decision? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely clear at this stage. President, has, President of Ukraine has announced the 10 points of the peaceful plan. Uh, whereas the negotiations is only one of the points. And uh, I think that everybody should stick to this understanding that this is a concentrated uh, set of actions needed to be, to be done. On Ukrainian side, we will be moving on each of these points. This is uh, the implementation of the MAGATE recommendations on the elimination of the nuclear threat, restoration of the grain corridor, uh, exchange of all prisoners of war, uh, bringing Russia to justice, then negotiations, and then security guarantees to Ukraine. So these are the key elements we will be moving towards regardless of any developments. And we hope that the partners will be sticking together with us. And then this will be the situation when we will be holding the file of the victory. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, I sit down with Admiral Rob Bauer. He is NATO's top military officer to talk about Russia and the future of the alliance. The perilous situation created by Russia in Ukraine has been the talk of the forum and it's top of mind for those who have to make life and death military decisions. Among those people, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, who was here at the forum and addressed those who were present. Not just countries that surround Ukraine, he says, who face a risk, but also NATO and allies, including those of us here at home in Canada. The outcome of the war in Ukraine will help determine the course of global security in this young century. And those of us in North America don't have the option of sitting this one out. Austin said Russia's aggression is a clear and historic challenge, and he again vowed to defend every inch of NATO territory. Admiral Rob Bauer serves as NATO's most senior military officer. I sat down with him here in Halifax to talk about NATO's response to Russia's war on Ukraine and what's at stake. Admiral Rod Bauer, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Well, great to be here, Mercedes. It is quite a time to be in your position at NATO. People thought the Cold War was over. Some still say it is, but the world and the way that the alliance works has changed tremendously. What do you believe the biggest threat to NATO is right now? Is it Russia? Yes. It is Russia and, and, and the terror group still, because that was the the sort of threat that we thought would go away with uh, operations far away from home, but that's not true. It is still there. So uh, we have two threats uh, defined for NATO, and that's what we are working on all these plans to make sure that we deter and uh, deter those threats in principle, and if it's necessary to defend against them. How concerned are you that Russia is willing to cross the line into a NATO country? Uh, we have not seen any evidence of the Russians uh, intending to do that. But uh, it is important to be prepared for it. That's what we're doing. And uh, so the message to Russia is that uh, we are not part of the war in Ukraine as NATO. And uh, at the same time, we are ready to defend ourselves. And uh, that readiness uh, has gone up. Our ability to do that has gone up. We have placed eight battle groups along the eastern flank after the start of the war uh, as a result of uh, uh, the changed posture of Russia because uh, it's not only Russia in uh, Ukraine, but it's also Russia in Belarus. And uh, it is about a more aggressive intent from President Putin. So we need to be ready to defend ourselves. 
uh, more than, 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 a, than a couple of years ago. What does your intelligence say about Putin's calculus on that? Is, is he worried about confronting NATO? Is that something that he thinks there's a low chance of? When the Russians are doing their calculations for targeting, we all know they don't have great accuracy, so accidents can happen. But in terms of deliberate provocations or testing of limits or testing of responses, what are you seeing about how Vladimir Putin is thinking this through? Yeah. We don't see um, that there is an intent in terms of uh, trying to test NATO other than what he has done in terms of our unity and our uh, ability to remain united uh, uh, in response to what he did uh, on the 24th of February. I don't think President Putin expected uh, a united NATO the way uh, we were and still are. I don't think he expected a united European Union the way it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it was and still is. Um, so uh, it, it, he didn't expect a united, uh, united States and uh, Europe the way uh, it is. So in many ways he made the wrong cal calculations. And I think he thought that if he was able to, uh, to basically kick out President Zelensky and take over Ukraine in a matter of less than two weeks, then he would get away with it. And he hasn't. With the incident in Poland, take us inside those discussions. How close were you to Article 5? I would say what was extremely important after it happened is the calm and measured and professional response from the Polish authorities. And uh, they were basically saying, you know, we have to investigate this. It is a serious thing. There's two people killed. Uh, there's an explosion, and so we have to find out what happened. But before we make any uh, assessment or any conclusion, uh, we will have to find out what happened. And basically, it ha of course, happened in the dark. It was, uh, it was raining, so it took a while. But then in the early hours of the, of the next morning, uh, it became clear that it was uh, the result of uh, a Ukrainian uh, missile that actually was defending, was used in defense of its own, of, the, of, uh, of, of Ukraine, uh, as a result of the uh, huge missile attacks by the Russians that day. And uh, so the announcement or the, the, the press conference from Secretary General after the North Atlantic Council convened the next morning at 10 o'clock uh, Brussels time, uh, and he, I think his press conference was like quarter past 12, uh, the statement was, this is uh, the result, uh, this is not a deliberate attack from Russia. Uh, this is uh, the result of a defensive action from Ukraine. And Russia still is to be blamed for this, because if they didn't start the war on 24 February, this would have never happened. So I think um, Poland has to be commended for the way, res way uh, they uh, responded. Uh, there was no panic. It was very, very professional, and I think as an alliance as a whole, we never panicked, and we were measured, professional, and calm. So it sounds to me like you're saying the red line there perhaps is not a strike. It's being sure that it's a deliberate strike. How hard is that, though, when you're talking about the fog of war, as you just illustrated it, and how things are happening in real time? There's pressure to respond. People are frightened. How do you handle that? Yeah. It's exact, exactly as you said, it's the fog of war. So what you need to do in, when you're driving around in a fog is to reduce speed a little bit to make sure that you're not hitting anything unintentionally. And I think that is what uh, uh, the Alliance has done, to um, not jump to conclusions, but to actually look at it, uh, to investigate it, to find out the facts, and then based on those facts to um, take a decision. And, and, and that will happen in any situation. Um, so if the outcome would have been, if the outcome would have been a deliberate attack, the outcome of the discussions might have been different. So I think it is very important to, 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 to know the facts, then to have the discussion, and then the decision. And, and that's exactly what happened. So uh, even with a deliberate attack, there will be an investigation. There will be uh, a discussion, and then there will be most likely, if it's a deliberate attack, a different outcome. But uh, uh, so uh, I think as a result of the fog of war, as a result of the fact that in many cases you will have to take a little bit of time, unless there's a massive attack like the invasion in Ukraine 
from three directions, then then it's not like, is this a deliberate attack? This is then, that, then it, that is immediately clear. But uh, if it is something like this, then we will take some time, not a lot, but some time to find out what it was and then take a, a, a decision. NATO officially is not involved in this conflict, but NATO countries are contributing significant amounts of arms and other military supplies, including Canada. What is at stake for the Ukrainians in being able to maintain access to those sorts of abilities? And what happens if Ukraine loses this war? If Ukraine, to start with the most important one, if Ukraine loses this war, um, it's not the end of hostilities, it's not the end of instability, it is the start of more instability. If Ukraine loses this war, we will see based on the Russians' uh, uh, intentions, which is uh, to restore the Russian Empire, to go back to the Soviet Union type of uh, uh, size of, 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 the, of the Soviet Union. If that is the case, then the, the next nation might be Moldova, the next nation might be Georgia. So that is not the end of hostilities, but it is uh, the start of the next hostility somewhere else. So it is Therefore, very important that uh, Ukraine does not lose this war with Russia. It is important that if people think that we, if we would stop supporting Ukraine now because it is becoming too expensive for us, then actually that is not true because the, uh, the Russians will still use in other times and in other conflicts maybe food, energy, migration as a weapon. So that is not connected only to the war in Ukraine. It is connected to their um, intent to use everything they have to destabilize Europe and uh, to, uh, to, to, to break our unity. And I think uh, they have not been successful. I don't, don't really think it. I know they have not uh, been successful. I see unwavering support. Uh, there is not the start of a crack in that unity. So I'm impressed by what has happened so far, but it is extremely important that we continue. Thank you so much for joining us today, Admiral Bauer. Well, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. As the Halifax International Security Forum wraps up, we cast our eyes back to Ottawa. Up next, we'll talk about what's expected to happen in a very big week for the Emergencies Act inquiry. Halifax International Security Forum wraps up. Discussions here about defense and security will change discussions in Ottawa about national security. Looking at the invocation of the Emergencies Act, we're expecting to hear from eight cabinet ministers and the prime minister himself as they argue that they were justified in using the act. We'll take a look at that and all their testimony next week here on the West Block. For now, I'm Mercedes Stevenson. Have a great week and we'll see you right back here next Sunday.